Welcome to the lecture on energy and power and the history of human energy use. We will first go through some definitions related to energy and power and then give a brief overview of the energy history of mankind and formalize our understanding by redefining the concept of socio-economic metabolism of industrial societies. So what is energy? Colloquially speaking, energy is a state of the person to get stuff done, like organizing events and so on. In physics, it's quite similar, but a bit more formal. In physics, energy is a state property of an object, like a car or a molecule. And the state that the object is in allows it to perform work on other objects, like moving them or breaking up chemical bonds. So energy is a state quantity that is defined as the ability to be able to transform work on other objects. Energy is a conserved quantity. So when I perform work on another object, the energy that I have is transformed to the other object. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. That's very important. This is why we talk about energy conversion and never about energy generation. The unit with which we measure energy is the joule. And joule is the energy that I transfer to an object by moving it over the distance of one meter against the force of one newton. So energy can be calculated as force times distance. So think of you pushing a car together with a few friends, then you can calculate the work that's being transformed, so the energy that's converted by multiplying the force that you exert times the distance that you push. And power is the rate at which energy is transferred between objects. For example, in the picture, the horse pulling the carriage, we said work is transferred when you exert a force over a certain distance. So let's say the horse pulls the carriage with a constant force over 100 meters. This process can be done in 10 seconds or it can take two minutes. And it, in both cases, the work performed and the energy transferred it's the same because it's force times distance it doesn't say anything about the speed at which the process happens so there's another dimension to energy transfer and this is the speed at which it happens so if you take the work that's being performed so the force times the distance and you divide it by the time interval that this process takes then you get the rate of the energy transfer or the power Power is then measured in joule, which is work, per second, so the rate of energy transfer. And in the old days, we would measure this power in terms of how many horses we would need to get a certain work done in the certain time, and the power that one horse could deliver is one horsepower. This is not the force that with which one horse can pull, it is the rate of work that the horse can perform over a certain period of time. Energy and power have specific applications. With energy, we can measure total work done and the work converted over time. We can also use it to determine the total amount of something produced over time. For example, when we know the energy input into a steel mill, we know how much steel can be produced with that energy. So it's something that tells us at which scale things can happen. Whereas power tells you something at which rate things can happen. So how big an energy conversion device has to be dimensioned to get the energy transferred in a certain amount of time. For example, if you think about a wind turbine, a wind turbine can be quite small and deliver a certain quantity of electricity over, let's say, two years. From this, you can calculate the average power, which is total energy delivered divided by two years. Now you scale up this wind turbine, maybe make it three times taller and make the blades larger and so on. And now suddenly, the same energy that it took two years to deliver with the old wind turbine now is delivered in four months. So same energy but much shorter time meaning that the new wind turbine has a much larger power than the old one. So this is the difference between energy and power. 
Be aware of that power has many different meanings in English language and in particular we have a confusion between power as the rate of energy and power as an alternative word for electricity which is a form of energy. So whenever somebody talks about power or you read something about power you need to be sure what exact meaning is dealt with here in the case of our lecture and in general for energy and sustainability when we talk about power we mean the rate of energy transfer and when we talk about electricity we will say in most cases electricity it's very important to know the different units of energy and power the megajoule the gigajoule and so on the terawatt hours so they all have specific meanings and definitions for which we have a link here just a few examples are provided here and the same for power we have different watts and kilowatt numbers provided here and over time once you deal with energy and sustainability issue it's also important to learn about the orders of magnitude how much energy do I need to for example drive a car for a certain distance here it says it's roughly 2 megajoule per kilometer or what is the power of my car, what is the typical power of a wind turbine, and so on. I put things into relation. This is crucial once you do calculations to check whether your results actually make sense and are correct. Now we would like to take a look at how the energy use changed over human history. And formally, we describe the different energy use types by so-called social metabolic regimes. You probably have heard of the different development phases of mankind, the hunter-gatherer, the agrarian and the industrial society. And we know that these different types of societies are characterized by very different political and societal institutions, by the way people live and how they organize their life. We also know that these three epochs of human development differ drastically in their energy and material use. So it's not only a different development stage culturally, it's also a very different development stage for the energy material consumption. And these different development stages are called the socio-metabolic regimes. Because socio-economic metabolism is the turnover of material and energy in society, and regimes denotes these three different stages of development. Here we see a timeline that shows the transition from one regime to another. So about 6,000 years ago there was a major transition, it's called the Neolithic Revolution, from the hunter-gatherer to the agrarian societies in large parts, large fractions of the planet. And now we have another major transition ongoing from agricultural society to industrial society that's still ongoing in many countries where people are still moving from the countryside to the cities and change their lives from being farmers to being workers in an industrial regime. The energy material flows differ a lot between the regimes. In the hunter and gatherer society most of the energy turnover is actually the food that people ate. Apart from that there was not much energy that people consumed. This changes a lot once you go from hunter-gatherer to the agrarian society because suddenly you have a lot of animals that you keep and these animals also have their own metabolism so you need to provide them with food which is energy for them to live. Also you have a lot more firing wood and cooking wood used because the um, agrarian society expands to regions where it's very hard to survive in the winter, so you need to supply yourself with external energy for heating. In the industrial society, we consume even more energy to operate all devices that we need, the cars, the buildings, the communication infrastructure, and so on, the industrial infrastructure that supplies all the commodities. So a huge material and energy turnover. So we can see that as mankind develops, it develops towards levels of very high energy material consumption. And the question is of course, to what extent can Earth supply such high levels of energy material consumption over a longer time for a large number of people? So these flows that we can see here directly link to questions of sustainability. So we can describe or define that 
we say that energy material turnover has a large impact on how society's institutions are shaped and what the cultural practice is. If energy is always scarce, things like car driving or excessive buildings, very large buildings, don't make sense. They cannot be deployed at a large scale. So we can see that the energy that we have available determines what we can do, determines what we value, and vice versa, what we value determines how much energy we need for it, and we're willing to get it and to invest for it. So there's this co-evolution of cultural institution and human society and the energy material turnover. So both are intertwined. That's very important to understand. Here we see a few numbers, both in terms of population density that the different regimes can support, and also, again, the different energy and material turnover. So that's, again, a very important overview to see how drastically these regimes differ. Very important that only the industrial society can sustain high population densities in the long run. The reason is that transport over long distances is cheap in industrial society. It's almost impossible to have a lot of transport with hunter-gatherers, gatherers, and it's very expensive to have a lot of transport in agricultural societies, we will see in a minute. So once you use fossil fuels or later renewable energies like solar and wind electricity, you have a lot of relatively cheap energy that enables you to transport the goods that are needed to sustain high population density in selected places. The human brain needs a lot of energy, and scientists have found out that as the human brain developed, people switched their diet. They switched to an omnivore diet, including meat, and they developed processing of food, in particular cooking, to make the meat easier to digest. So in that sense, we could say humans are a pyrophile species, so in a sense we can make active use of the fire to sustain our own metabolism. The metabolism of a human person is roughly three and a half to four gigajoule per person and year, or in different units it's about two thousand to two and a half thousand kilocalories per day. Interestingly also, the actual direct metabolism of hunter gatherers is only the food that the people in those societies ate. But if you think that these people also used fire to clear the forest to have better hunting grounds, you can actually calculate that these societies had a quite high turnover if you include all the artificial fires in their metabolism. So despite their very low population density, they had a very strong impact on the lands where they lived. So we would say today that the hunter-gatherers, they transformed their own ecological niche. So they transformed the place they lived in to make it for suitable for them. So it's a very interesting interrelation between a certain species and the way the species impact the natural surroundings. And of course we still have this today, but on a much larger scale. So back then, we have estimated that only 1 over 10,000 to 1 over 100,000 of the total biomass produced in the environment was actually used by the hunter-gatherers. So a lot of biomass is available to other species, so it's a much more diverse living environment than the artificial environments we live in today. So when we now move on to the agricultural societies, the uh, living patterns change drastically, so people have a fixed place where they live. Locally we have very high population density, so you need long trade routes, supply chains to get especially grain and other food and sometimes also water to the place where people live. And because of the animals that are kept and the firewood used in cooking wood, the um, energy turnover increases a lot from 4 gigajoule per year to 60 to 80 gigajoule. Because of the high population density, there's less meat available. So the ratio of animals to people overall decreases compared to the hunter-gatherer society. So much less meat in those diets. It's a very different lifestyle. 
one of the most crucial constraints in agricultural society is the transport. Transport costs are prohibitive and the reason is that people did not have fossil fuels available. So what do you do when you transport? You either pull or carry the stuff yourself or you have an animal that does it, but you need to eat. And where do you get the food from? You need to use land to farm the food. So you can imagine that if you have a horse carriage with a lot of grain on it and you move it, at some point the horses will have to eat part of the grain. So the further you transport, the less grain will be available for the final consumers. And here on this slide, a few cost factors that have been estimated from hindsight are listed. And especially you can see that the uh, costs from going to sea transport, to canal, to carriage, to pack animals, always increases roughly by a factor of three. So for long distances, transport by horse carriage and pack animal is prohibitive. So all what's left is using canals or putting cities close to the sea where you can use other forms of energy to transport over long distances. And that means that this transport costs always have to be factored in when countries and are planned and policies are made. Cities more or less have to be close by the sea to have access to relatively cheap ocean transport and that of course puts certain constraints on what you can do with your country as a whole. So in agricultural societies land is a very scarce resource and if you think about the history it's always who controls the land. It is about starting wars. If you want to grow your economy in an agricultural society all you can do is conquer other people's ter territories because then you have more land available. More land means more energy either wood or grazing land or grains or other plants and this then you can use to fuel your economic operations. So land constraint is a huge issue in agricultural society. It's still a case today because even though we use fossil fuels and renewable energies in the future we are still land constrained. So we still have that constraint from the agricultural society in our society for growing food and for growing biomass. So when we now promote biomass as a potentially sustainable solution for energy supply, we're actually shifting back towards an agricultural society because biomass is a land constrained product. And we know from this society, from history, that we can only do this to a certain extent. Because the available land limits the amount of biomass that you can grow. So if we want to sustain the high energy metabolism of industrial societies for a long time and for many people, we need to find other solutions next to just harvesting bioenergy in the future. We need to become much more efficient in providing services with the energy that we have and we need to find other forms of energy that have a higher area density. For example, photovoltaics as it's shown here. With photovoltaics on a fixed area of like one square kilometer, you can harvest up to 50 times more energy than you can with biomass. So if it's all about converting sunlight to energy, we have technical solutions that are much more efficient than photosynthesis. And that, of course, means two things. The first is we can get the same amount of energy with much less land. So we could use some land for biodiversity concerns rather than for harvesting energy so we can convert it to. But it also of course means that there's a lot of pressure to convert land into technical installation like solar farms to harvest all this energy. So there's a lot of land impact for renewable energy that needs to be managed. Now we will introduce the energy metabolism of the industrial societies which has overcome the main limitation of energy use in agricultural societies, which is the area constraint. So by using fossil fuels that are much more concentrated sources of energy because they can be harvested at any time, any rate from a given place, the overall energy turnover per person 
increased by a factor of 4 to 5. Using the fossil fuels to power factories to produce goods and services in houses to heat the houses or in transport. So these are the three large energy using sectors, industry, houses and transport. And of course these fossil energy forms come with a lot of environmental problems. Both the local pollution that can be seen here from these old pictures which can, we can manage today using filters and efficient combustion, but also global challenges, especially, of course, the climate change. So as the Industrial Revolution continues, we invent and develop more and more efficient devices, and we accompany this transposition to efficient devices to also a transformation of our society as a whole, the services, the political system, the industrial infrastructure, so everything transforms around these devices that supply us with cheap and efficient energy services. So now, today, we have a lot of individual mobility in rich countries, which at this scale was impossible 200 years ago. There was simply not enough cheap energy to have everybody ride their own car, even if they would have known how to do this, they wouldn't have had all the energy. So you see how the arrival of the energy plus the development of energy conversion devices then enables certain lifestyles and then we build our society around these lifestyles. And the big question is now of course how do we need to transform society, lifestyle and industry to become more socially and environmentally sustainable. So we see from the history that in terms of energy, industrial revolution means that wood is largely replaced by fossil fuels as the major energy carriers. And fossil fuels include coal, petroleum and later natural gas. And now you see here at the top right corner of this graph that we have also a new transition that's slowly starting. It's the transition to renewable energies. And on one side, and I think this is one of the most important take-home messages from this lecture, on one side renewable energies are the step into the future. Because we get rid of fossil fuels and we harvest lots of low carbon energy that is also cheaper and cheaper. But on the other side, renewable energies are also a step back into the past because renewable energies are space constrained, area constrained. I need a certain amount of area to harvest the energy. For example, I need a certain area of land to put the PV panels on, I need a certain amount of land to put the wind turbines on and so on. So we have this two-sided problem here. It's a transition into the future, low carbon, cheap energy, but we also need to manage the area constraints and there we can of course learn a lot from the agricultural regimes and how energy constraints there and area constraints played a role in shaping society. And we need now to think and to design a new future. We know that the industrial lifestyle as we have it now it's not sustainable. There are too many problems. There's a lot of growth happening, a lot of positive human development, but it's not sustainable because we're eating up slowly consuming the possibilities of the future generations. And the question now is, and this is not something we can easily answer, is it enough to just fix a few things in the industrial metabolism, like basically becoming more efficient, or do we really need a more fundamental transformation, including also transformation of values of lifestyles? So this is an ongoing challenge in the sustainability science to understand what scales we have in the system and what transformation do we need and how can the different transformation, the energy, the cultural transformation can actually be interlinked to deliver the outcomes that we need very soon because the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis are actually developing very rapidly. So with this broad overview and introduction and this open question, I would like to close this lecture and thank you for your attention.